Glory be to thee, O Lord. Praise be to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, please be seated. I ran into an article yesterday in, of all places, the Sydney Morning Herald, in which, and yes, Sydney, Australia, in which my hometown, Decatur, Illinois, featured prominently. I am not kidding. And it was really a story about the sheriff in my home county, Macon County, uh, where the, the, the jail and the sheriff's office is in Decatur, right downtown, about three blocks from where the house I grew up. But this sheriff is a little bit different. His name is Howard Buffett. And his father is a billionaire named Warren Buffett. Howard, unlike his father, he's, he's, he's very different in a lot of ways, but he's also similar in a lot of ways. And he's not a Democrat, he's a Republican, for example. And although he, he's not really into finance, he's a farmer. He literally has a big farm just down the road from where my dad has this little cottage. And they run into each other every now and then, and we'll talk about farming. My dad owns a farm, so they talk about farming. At any rate, Howard Buffett also does other things. He, he is a photographer, and he owns or runs a philanthropy. Uh, when he was a little younger, his father gave each of his children a billion dollars and said, here's the catch, you have to give it away. Do with it as you see fit, but you got to give it away. And so each of these children, they've created these philanthropic organizations, and he runs one, and he does a lot of work in South Africa um, with that one. However, last year, he was appointed as sheriff of Macon County. 
And he was appointed to fill an unfulfilled term. The, the other sheriff retired. And he could do this in part because for the previous seven years, he had been a deputy and undersheriff. This is what you do when you become a billionaire. You become the deputy. But he said, you know, my time in the sheriff's office has been a real eye-opener. And this is, not, this is not pretend policing here. My hometown is not a place you pretend to do policing. It makes Newburgh look like Donnybrook Farm. But he does patrol the streets and the, of the roads of Macon County and the streets of Decatur, and he finds both the well-off, because there are plenty of well-off there, and the destitute. And as I could have predicted, the worst problem he ran into was the growing drug crisis. This is in part because Decatur is smack dab between Chicago in the north and St. Louis in the south. And for as long as I can remember, it's always been the, the, the route through which the drugs traffic or travel. So they always have always ended up in Decatur. He knew this. He's been there for 20-some years. But he's not despondent. Even though he was shocked, he was not despondent. He said, you know, this has been a huge education to me. Knowledge you can't get unless you're out on the streets every day and you can walk into people's homes and really see how they live, which is what he had been doing. And what did he learn? In his words, he said, locking drug addicts up is not going to solve the problem. It is not going to get them off the drugs. The problem is... We have in the U.S., no, I'm sorry, the problem we have in the U.S. is that we don't have enough places to put them in for treatment and a shortage of resources to properly help them when they get out of treatment. So, and it helps to have a sheriff who's a billionaire. He has been using some of the money he inherited, and it's a lot of money, to do something about it indicator. He built a drug treatment center opening this year, the likes of which have never been seen, at least not in central Illinois. It's large. It has lots of greenery and walking paths. It is designed, as he said, not to simply get them off drugs, but to help them learn how to smile again. And he got that from uh, the director of the only free hospital indicator. Uh, her name is Tanya Andrix. Oddly enough, I went to school with the Andrix, so I know these folks. And she had said to him, you can't just get them off drugs. Or you can't just get them out of prison. Because if they go to a job interview and they don't know how to smile, nobody wants to hire them. If they don't have that smile inside, they can't do anything teach him how to smile again. And so he's built this, and it is all free. His time policing has also helped him understand how we can train police differently. So in conjunction with some of the best forensic specialists, he's also funded the creation of a new police training center in Decatur, or just outside of Decatur, open to police around the country. And the whole focus of the training, especially with new recruits, is for them to see the people they serve differently. As one of the guys who has already been working with them says, I grew up thinking in terms of black and white, us versus them. Now I think in terms of us. It's especially designed to help these officers understand why the use of force can in fact be counterproductive and how to find other options. Trust me, in my hometown, policing always involves the possibility of violence. So, these are great things. But why do I bring them up here? Because the core of this article addresses exactly what our gospel is talking about. Pardon, kindness, 
mercy, forgiveness, love. Jesus brings us this insane lesson today where he says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who abuse you. Give to those who beg. Lend without expectation of profit. He might as well have said, if they had known about it, heal the drug addicts. In essence, what Jesus was saying was, take care of all the people our society detests. Love them. These are things that our society detests. We are a people of profit. Lending without profit is not known to us. We are a people of vengeance and self-serving. You might argue the point, and there are good folks in this world, of course, in this country. But I see the commercials. I keep up with the news. I know that the general tenor of this society is, look out for number one. It is, after all, the very tenet of America first. I can't say this is unique to our country, though. It's pretty much worldwide. And I can't say it's unique to our time because it's always been that way. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have talked about it. But I can say that to the degree we fall into this trap, we're falling away from God. And I can say that this attitude is not new with Jesus. The whole attitude that pardon has power. Jesus didn't invent that. You can even see it in Genesis, where Joseph forgives his brothers for selling him into slavery. Now, you might say, well, he had to do that. They're, for, they're, they're family, right? You've got to do that for family. But remember this. Here's the backstory. They always hated him. He was never treated with love by them. It wasn't just that they sold him into slavery, and remember that before that they were thinking of killing him. It's that they always made fun of him. They were always jealous of him. There is only so much you can do because of family. But when you see the people who have made your life a living hell and they ask for forgiveness and you say, I forgive you. That pardon has power. Up to this point, I have said nothing new to you. And how could I? God's been around a lot longer than any of us. And the gospel's been around a lot longer than any of us. You know that Christ calls us to care for one another. So what more can I add to that, huh? This is all old news. All I can offer is a reflection on why. Why does God want us to care for each other in the first place? Why does God want us to love our enemies in the first place? That sounds crazy. Why does God want us to forgive, to refrain from judging, to pardon? Well, maybe the first reason is because it works. Virtually every study has shown that treating people with respect helps. That addressing the core causes of crime rather than the symptoms does far more to reduce crime. There's this town in Florida where they decided to do things differently and they invested money in free child care. Everybody, no questions asked. You want to bring your child to free child care? You got it. And free college for every high school student in that town. What happened? The reason they did it was because they were desperate because the place was falling apart. Because they had one of the highest recidiv uh, dropout rates, they had one of the highest teen pregnancy rates, 
It had one of the highest crime rates in Florida. What happened? Crime dropped and high school graduation soared to almost 100%. And, I might add, at a lower cost than all the money they've been plowing into the prisons. We have something like that in, in New York, a little bit. We have the, the prison college initiatives. You're familiar with that? Bard College does it. Where inmates are given the opportunity to attend college classes. Where they're given the opportunity to graduate from college. This is shown time and time again to improve behavior in prison, to reduce recidivism rates, and to create productive, positive citizens when they return to society, all at a lower cost than simply imprisoning them. And yet, when these initiatives started, there were so many objections to taking care of them. Why are you rewarding them for their crimes, giving them college degrees? Maybe I should tell my kid to go commit crimes so he can go to college and get a college degree. The cost of college is another thing, and as a parent who is in the middle of that nightmare, I assure you I can, I can sympathize with the high cost of college these days. But here's the question. What were people really objecting to? Were they objecting to the idea of effectively bringing new citizens into our society at a, at a, at a cost-effective way, where they become much more productive? Were they objecting to that? Or were they objecting to the idea that somebody who did something wrong should be treated as a human being? So let me ask you this. What do you think the purpose of prison is? Is it to keep us safe? Is it to reduce crime? And if it's so, the way the American prison system has been going hasn't worked. Or is it for revenge, to make them pay? I would argue for many of us, it's the revenge. We don't want them coming out of prison better off than they were when they went in. We want them to suffer, preferably forever. They're different from us, undeserving, evil animals. And yeah, I have heard people call inmates every single one of those words. The only problem for us is, Jesus says they're not different from us. I asked, why does God want us to love our enemies? And the answer is really simple, because that's who God is. God is love. If we want to be close to God, if we want to know God, if we want to be children of the Most High, that is the only way. Granted, it's not the only way for God to love us, but it is the only way for us to grow closer, to know more fully, to be in love with the one who is kind, unjudging, and merciful. The only way to really know the one who is love is to love. Or as Jesus says, if you love, if you forgive, if you pardon, if you care, your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High for He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Now, I'm betting that most of us here do not have the vast resources available to someone like Howard Buffett, where we can put into action a vision of pardon and mercy. Certainly not in terms of building training centers and building rehab centers. But we do have resources. 
And we have our hearts and our minds and our mouths and our hands. And we can be the people who see the enemy differently. We can be the people who see the poor differently. We can be the people who see the inmate not as the other, but as a brother or sister who might just need a chance to learn how to smile again. That's the power of pardon that Jesus was talking about. And he has given that power to us. Amen.